So when I think about things, I like to make things as simple as possible. Um, and so when you think about spinal dysraphism, there's all kinds of categories and uh, different ways of thinking about things in terms of embryology and um, subsequent management, presentation, uh, cell lines, things like that. But I like to think of these in a very simple way uh, in two categories. So open or what you might have known as, as spina bifida aperta, um, and then there's closed, which is spina bifida occulta, okay? So I think about these things as open and closed. And if you think about that from a surgical standpoint, it makes things very simple for you. So this is a, a more complicated table, but it's kind of been broken down in a way that we look at open and closed. So we're going to start off by talking about open spinal dysraphism and the most commonly seen open neural tube defect or open spinal dysra uh, dysraphism topic is myelomeningocele. And that makes up 98% of open spinal dysraphism cases that we see. Other ones include a myelocele, a hemimyelomeningocele, Seal and a hemimyelocele. I'll tell you the bottom three I have never encountered in clinical practice or in training. Um, closed spinal dysraphism, we'll go through these categories a bit later on, um, but I want to spend a majority of our time today talking about myelomeningocele. So when we talk about normal embryology of the spine, the most important process that we talk about is neurulation, uh, which is really uh, fancy for development of the brain and the spinal cord. When you talk about closure of the open neural tube, it typically uh, happens first in the upper cervical region, and then it extends down to L1, L2, and then it comes back rostrally towards the nasion. These, these kind of slides here show you the, the general uh, embryology of this area where you have a flat neural plate that's surrounded by ectoderm. And as this process happens, that neural plate folds and that ectoderm comes into a position that's superficial or superior. And the third plate shows a normal neural tube that's completely closed, surrounded by neural crest cells more superficially, and then the ectoderm on top of that. Now, primary neurulation describes the, the term for the spinal cord uh, formation all the way to the lower lumbar level, and abnormalities in primary neurulation lead to myelomeningocele formation, lipomyelomeningocele formation, intraspinal dermoid and epidermoid cysts, and split cord malformations, all of which I'll talk about later, so don't get hung up on the terms too much. These typically, this process of primary neurulation typically occurs uh, at days 18 to 28 of development. The caudal most aspect, again, below the lower lumbar level, uh, undergoes what's called secondary neurulation. And that happens between days 28 and 48 of development. And this typically is two processes known as canalization and subsequent regression. So when we talk about canalization of the spine, this is really this caudal cell mass, um, and it forms the distal spinal segments as well as the nerves that encompass and go with these segments of the spinal cord. When we talk about regression, we talk about involution of partial uh, a, a partial aspect of this caudal cell mass, which involutes and it forms the phylum terminale, which is really the distal aspect of the spinal cord, and it doesn't routinely have function in it. So after the phylum terminale is, is formed, the vert vertebral canal actually grows faster than the neural tube. And so oftentimes a, a routine question for fourth year medical students and interns is, well, at what age uh, does the conus medullaris ascend to its anatomic position? And typically this happens at about three months. So at birth, the tip or the bottom of the conus typically occurs at between L2 and L3 can be as low as L3. 3L4. And at three months of age, again, as that vertebral column grows, uh, but the neural tube uh, is not growing as quickly, that changes to its position at L1, L2, which typically stays at for the rest of, of their life. And so that's a, a common thing to recognize, especially as you work up neural tube defects and spinal dysraphism uh, to see uh, if there's tethering of the spinal cord, because you want to look at the location of the conus. 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.